Hi everybody, this is a video lecture on the concepts of reproduction, development, and comfort, specifically focusing on, on intrapartum. And intrapartum is where we move towards delivery. Now, I'm gonna go through your PowerPoint like as I've done for all of your other uh, video lectures. However, um, there's some things that I'm not gonna be able to really talk about because they really need to be demonstrated or shown in class with some of the models that we have. So I am gonna do the best that I can um, just so that you do have some additional resources when you're studying. So for starters, um, our PowerPoint starts out with the five P's, um, powers, passageway, passenger, psych, and position, and all of these are different but very important facets in moving somebody towards labor. So we will start with the powers, and there's two different types of powers. There's the involuntary or the primary powers or the secondary, which are more voluntary. Um, primary um, powers are involuntary uterine contractions that occur in the upper part of the uterus. And you're going to see, like, um, when, you, as we had talked um, last week, when the uterus is not in labor, the cervix is at the bottom and it's thick and it's long and it's closed and it's kind of to the back. Well, what it has to do is it has to come forward, it has to thin, and it has to dilate. So, therefore, in the beginning of labor, the bottom part of the uterus is very thick but as the fetus pulls down because of the force of the contractions going here and here this becomes thinner and this becomes thicker as it's kind of pushing the fetus out so it applies pressure on the amniotic sac it applies pressure um, uh, therefore dilating the cervix um, and um, thinning it out and that is the job of contractions is to thin out the cervix or the other word is called efface and the other thing is to dilate it Okay, so I will be passing out um, this different type of uh, model right here. And it kind of, you can see how it's more thicker here and thinner here, but it's actually um, larger, largely dilated. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to see the differences between um, all of the, the stages of dil dilatation. Okay, um, in class, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, frequency, duration, intensity. Um, you know, sometimes when you're externally monitoring, it's, it's very difficult to tell how strong a contraction is, even if they look like they're mountains on the monitor strip, because a lot of it has to do with placement. But if you put your hands on the person's um, belly or the uterus, you know, um, a mild contraction feels kind of like the tip of the nose. A moderate contraction feels like your chin, and then a very firm contraction feels like the tip of your forehead. Um, what... There's a, a reflex called the Ferguson reflex, and that is when the woman starts to feel tons of pressure, and she starts feeling that as that the presenting part gets to what we call a plus one station, which I will talk about, um, so that as the baby comes lower, it kind of triggers this reflex, which allows you know uh, mom to feel that pressure so that she can push. Secondary uh, powers are more voluntary, um, and that's usually controlled by the laboring woman. And that's more of the pushing aspect. Um, and it's the it's defined in your book as the bearing down movement of the abdomen and the diaphragm. So again, that's where like you use the same muscles if like if you're constipated or if you're trying to have a bowel movement, it's the same thing pushing out the fetus. Um, we'll talk about the anatomy of the pelvis a little bit. There's like two parts of it. There's like the false pelvis and there's the true pelvis. Um, and the, the false pelvis is that wing portion, and really that's not as important as is the, the true pelvis, uh, specifically when we discuss ischial spines. And ischial spines are the narrowest part of the, the passageway where the fetus has to come through. Now, as, as a woman goes into labor, there is um, hormones called, well, estrogen, as, you, as you're aware of, and there's another one called relaxin that allows the pelvis to conform so that the fetal, pa uh, fetal can pass through. And also, like, it does something to soft tissue and the pelvic floor, and it kind of relaxes that part. And we will talk a little bit about that. Um, in class, we're gonna, I'm going to show you what we, what we talk about station and the cardinal movements of labor. But station is the level of where the presenting part, hopefully it's the, the, the cephalic, the vertex, where it is in relation to those ischial spines. And those ischial spines, again, are the narrowest part of the true pelvis. So when you reach the ischial spines, they say you're at zero station or you are engaged, so that the fetus has reached engagement. There's a lot of things that have to do with that that it's safe to do, like example, like breaking somebody's water um, is safe to do at zero station. 
Anything above zero station as the fetus starts to move down is in the negative number, so minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four is considered floating. Um, and then you get into below the ischial spine, so as that fetus starts to move down, plus one, plus two, plus three, and then out. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The passenger is our baby, and we specifically look at the baby's head, the position, the attitude, and the lie. Uh, we've already talked about station, and we've already talked about engagement, but this is all part of this process or um, the cardinal movements of labor. I'm going to show you, I'm going to kind of pass around a little skull. I don't have it with me right here, but I probably should have. Uh, but it's the largest and the least malleable part of the fetus. Molding, as you learned um, when we talked about the newborn, when we examined the newborn, is a process by which the sutures and the fontanelles move such that the shape of the head can change just temporarily um, as in reference to the birth canal. Oftentimes, the bones of the skull will kind of overlap just because of the movement of the sutures so that the fetus is allowed to um, come down. Um, as far as presentation goes, um, vertex or cephalic is the most common. Um, and you've heard of the, the famous fetal position. So that's when the chin is down, the knees are up, and um, the elbows are in. Like you'll say, oh, he was in a fetal position. That is like the most popular. It's the most efficient and efficacy way of, of delivering this uh, baby because that means the measurements are at the, the, the smallest in, in relation to mom's pelvis coming through. So I'm going to show you some different positions like, you know, if, if the head is like this, that's like the, we call that the military style or the syncopate um, position. And that increases those measurements and it makes it harder for labor. So we have to talk about like positioning, um, um, a woman moving in labor so that she gets into the proper position. Um, so you'll see some um, pictures um, on your PowerPoint in your book, and we'll talk about that briefly in class. Um, the other thing, too, is um, um, attitude is um, the uh, refers to the position of the fetal body parts in relation to each other. So you can see where, like, flexion is the best one. So that's the attitude. The lie is the way um, the baby or the fetus is laying in relation to mom. So you can see on your on your PowerPoint if a mo if a baby is up and down, whether it's head down or butt down, and it's laying this way, it's longitudinal. If it's laying this way, it's transverse, and you cannot deliver vaginally with a transverse um, presentation. Um, the next P is called psych, um, and again, um, it there's a whole lot that goes into a woman's um, psych, um, her attitude towards labor. Um, whether she's stressed out, whether she doesn't have a good relationship with her support person. Uh, maybe this was an unplanned pregnancy. Um, maybe there's just a lot, she had a bad experience the last time. So her state of mind plays a big role in how this particular labor is going to go. Um, sometimes we have first time moms who sometimes people don't even know they're pregnant until they go into labor. Um, or um, maybe they just had a terrible experience last time. So they come in with a chip on their shoulder or they come in um, you know, just haven't done any classes, haven't done any preparation at all, you know, and that plays a big role in it as well, as does a support system. So having a good support system and not having a good support system is very important, okay, because we need somebody who's going to be there for this mom who is going to be supportive and um, be there for her because we don't need any fighting. And believe me, I've seen it a million times where the tension, you could cut it, cut it with a knife. I'm going to say this um, a lot, um, but if you want a longer labor, then just lay flat, all right? Just lay flat in your bed. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you can't lay in bed, but one of the things, the position is, is very true. Um, you have to move in labor. So whether you're walking around, standing at the side of the bed and just kind of rolling, sitting on a birthing ball, gravity is very important when it comes to the first stage of labor. Um, hands and knees or knee chest as we call it is really important laying on your side is really good um, you have to move during labor and the reason too is because there is a um, there's a syndrome called um, supine um, hypotension okay so again um, that is where that gravid uterus rests on that vena cava therefore decreasing perfusion and you might see some fetal heart changes and things like that and and decreases cardiac output on the mom and all of that. So um, 
for that purpose, mom should never be flat in bed. They should be up just a little bit or on their side, moving around as much as they can. Now, if they get an epidural, that's another story, okay? But still, we don't lay them flat. They have to um, change their positions to facilitate descent and to facilitate that whole process of labor. That's really important. All right, so getting into labor, um, there's a lot of people who come in and it's false labor. You need to know the difference between true labor and false labor. One of the things is there's a 411 rule. So if your contractions are every four minutes, it's been lasting a minute and it's been occur and occurring for an hour, chances are you might be in labor. But the thing that takes, um, that takes the cake or however you want to say it, um, that tells you we're in labor is that you dilate your cervix. You can contract every minute, you can, I don't care, you can be contracting all night, but if you don't change your cervix, you're not in labor. And that is what distinguishes the differences between true labor and false labor, is that you change your cervix. Now, there's a lot of things, like, you know, sometimes the contractions change, like they maybe increase with walking, whereas in false labor, they don't change, okay? Um, you know, d there is some changes in discomfort, but really the, the, the only thing that um, that's defined as labor is that you continuously change your cervix. Now, there's a lot of things that tell you that labor is going to happen, and these things can happen up to about four weeks before, except for SROM. SROM is spontaneous rupture of membranes if you break your water. If you break your water, um, you need to come into the hospital. You need to make sure that your baby's moving and all of that good stuff. The thing is, is that barrier has been broken. That it, the integrity of that amniotic sac has been broken. Infection is ascending, so therefore the the risk of infection is increased when you break your water. Up to like after 12 hours, 18 hours. That's a whole another story. Braxton Hicks contractions are those rehearsal contractions. Um, they sometimes are a nuisance. Um, they happen up, at, uh, you know, even starting like about 16 weeks pregnant. And that, um, that deal is that um, what they do as you start to labor is that they start to bring that cervix forward. They start thinning out your cervix. So there is a role for them when you get, when you're later in, la um, later in your pregnancy. Bloody show, the cervix is very vascular. So as that cervix starts to come forward and starts to dilate, you're going to have bloody show. Um, lightning. Lightning is when the fetus drops into the pelvis. So as you learned last week that it reaches its full at about between 36 and 38 weeks and then it drops. So remember you can breathe but now you're peeing like crazy and that is the baby getting ready into that um, um, ready for birth. Nesting is they say it's probably due to a lot of hormones is where a woman kind of goes around and just gets everything ready and just cleaning everything. Um, your cervix changes, so that's you can start, like those Braxton Hicks contractions are doing something. Um, GI symptoms, whether it's diarrhea or vomiting or bowel movements, it's nature's way, our way of kind of like getting rid of, of some of that, so to make room for that baby coming down. And then weight loss, they say that's just through fluid shifts and, and hormonal. Now, again, mucus plug is one thing that's not on this PowerPoint too, so the loss of your mucus plug could be anywhere up to a month before you actually... Um, um, go into labor. Um, when we rupture somebody's membranes or somebody comes in complaining that uh, they, their water has broken and it's not evident, we have to do what we call a sterile speculum exam and we can test it, to, well, th three ways. Two ways is on your PowerPoint. One is where you put the sterile spec in, you take a swab, you put it on a microscope, I mean, you put it on a slide, you put it under a microscope and you look and you see what is called ferning and it actually looks like a fern bush. Um, the other one is that litmus paper, it's nitrazine positive. Now there's things that's going to make nitrazine positive. One is blood, the other one is semen. Um, so you, unless there's a really good evidence, you need to kind of do both of them. There's a third method and it's called AmniSure, which is another swab that we put into a medium and we send it to the lab and we get results pretty quickly. Um, Probably the biggest thing for um, interventions after a rupture of membranes. So if your patient comes in complaining of rupture of membranes, and then you say, oh, has the baby been moving? And they'll say, you know what, I really haven't felt the baby move. You want to make sure that you check a fetal heart rate, okay? Because sometimes this is where our cord accidents happen, and you have a stillbirth, is that when your water breaks, the cord kind of settles in, the fetus settles down, and it clamps on that cord. 
and very it doesn't happen very often but I'm just saying is that is it's a different environment so that you need to check the baby's heart uh, heart rate even if we break the water in the hospital the first thing you want to do is just listen to the baby for quite some time and just to make sure that everything is good into this new environment um, I guess one pa on page 125 in your book it has step-by-step -step instructions on how to assess for it but this is the things that we we typically do um, okay, so there is four stages of labor that we're going to be talking about in this um, in this video. Um, the first stage is kind of like before delivery, so it's from zero centimeters up to ten centimeters, where you're from you know zero to ten. So here's ten, um, and that second stage is um, well, first stage goes into three stages. There's early, latent, okay, um, that's zero to three. Your active is four to seven, and your transition is eight to ten. Your book mentions active being three to seven, and that's fine. But you know what? Um, for our purposes and for any exam purposes, it'll be from four to seven, and then transition is eight to ten centimeters. And we'll talk about each of these in a second. Second stage goes from um, completely um, dilated up to ten centimeters to to delivery of the baby. Your third stage is from the delivery of the baby to the delivery of the placenta. And then your fourth stage is from the delivery of the placenta up to like one to four hours of postpartum or recovery. So we're going to talk about each of those. So in latent labor, that's your longest one from zero to three centimeters, especially for our first time moms. Contractions are mild, they're irregular, and women can typically, typically talk through them. Um, the latent phase is a period of excitement, especially for mostly our first time moms. They're like just so excited that the birth is finally here. Contractions last approximately maybe like 30 to 45 seconds. They can be anywhere between 3 and 30 minutes apart. Um, and they feel like menstrual cramps, okay? So this is where everyone's really excited and they want to bring in their whole posse into delivery. So then you get into active labor. So active labor is typically about 5 hours for a first-time mom and maybe 2 to 3 hours for a mom that's had a baby before. Contractions are a little bit stronger. Still about 30 to 45 seconds, but they're a little bit more frequent, so anywhere from three to five minutes apart. And the patient at this point is a little bit more introverted and a little bit more focused and really wants it quiet. And sometimes this is the stage where they want an epidural. Now, I'm not saying we don't ask, get re epidural requests like at two centimeters, because we do, okay? Um, but that is um, kind of like the stage of labor. Then transition is between eight and 10 centimeters. And it, when you're in transition, transition is when um, your moms are very um, irritable and um, anxious and they're sweating. They may be vomiting. They may have like sweat on their lip. Um, they are just, it's, it's the fastest stage. It's the most intense stage before you get to start pushing. So you make it um, to 10 centimeters and then you can start pushing. But let's just talk about the care of the patient in the first stage of labor. So uh, patients are admitted um, when they show progressive change in their cervix, if they broke their water, if there's something going on with fetal monitoring irregularities, uh, excuse me, or any maternal issues, we're going to um, have the mom um, be admitted. So again, you're gonna do a history and physical, you're gonna monitor this baby and kind of see what's going on with that. But the big thing is, is that you want to be respectful, we want to be encouraging, and we want to be supportive. We want to instruct and inform and monitor and inform again. So it's constant uh, changing um, as a mom progresses through that first stage of labor. Our overall goal is a safe delivery so that we have a healthy baby and a healthy mom. And we want them to have a positive experience at, at all costs, okay? So part of the things that we do is that we promote fetal oxygenation we promote placental perfusion, and we promote maternal comfort. Those are our three big goals, okay? So um, promoting fetal oxygenation, promoting placental perfusion, and promoting uh, maternal comfort. So that leads us right into the discussion of what do we do for somebody who's in pain. Now, there's a lot of things that, that um, affect a woman's pain tolerance, okay? There's physiological factors. I mean, she could just be going super fast. It could be her culture. Like somebody's more stoic than, than somebody who is very verbal, okay? Um, somebody who's very anxious um, sometimes is um, challenging as well. And then previous experience, like, like I said, if they had a great experience, they're gonna come in a little bit more um, happy. 
versus um, somebody who, um, who had a really negative um, experience. There's non-pharmacological methods of pain control versus pharmacologic methods. Non-pharmacologic methods, like a cool washcloth to the head, or hot packs, or a warm shower, uh, counter pressure, massage, uh, position changes, relaxation, and breathing techniques, imagery, focal, uh, focal point, music, um, there's a lot of things that, you know, um, play into the part of what we can do for our moms who um, are in labor and don't want anything for pain. Relaxation helps with fetal oxygenation. So again, remember our overall goal. So when you're like this and you're tense, that's going to take oxygen away from that fetus as well as, you know, not only for ten reduces tension and, and decreases perfusion to the uterine, to the uterine for uterine blood flow. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, you know, sometimes there's like, I just don't want anything. But you know, just like if they just relax a little bit, you know that they would dilate a little bit um, faster. So being supportive helps decrease her anxiety and fear and in informing her of what to expect. So you can offer pain medications in a non-judgmental way. Like, okay, you know what? You need your epidural. I mean, that's probably not the only thing to do unless you've developed that different type of rapport with your client. Um, but there's two things that we use um, today. One is IV Statol. Um, Statol is pretty much the norm now. One to two milligrams IV push. Um, you need a reactive fetal monitoring strip beforehand, which we'll talk about at the end of this um, uh, video. And because what happens is, is that if you know that you have a, a, a reassuring fetal status beforehand, um, it displays minimal variability um, after. So it also can cause neonatal uh, respiratory depression, increases that risk of for after delivery um, if it's too close and therefore we would have to give Narcan to this baby. So we try not to do that. Um, so there's that. This doesn't take away the pain of the contraction. It actually um, takes the edge off so that you're able to relax a little bit better in between contractions. You're still gonna have to go through the contraction and women are really groggy and things like that. And that's one that I'm not a big fan of just because when your baby's born, you want to be awake and you want to be happy and excited. Um, but it's still a choice that they can pick. The next one is the epidural where a needle is um, put into uh, the epidural space and then a catheter is thread and then they test it and then they dose it up. Um, two things that we have to do is we have to monitor urine output because um, the epidural, um, when mom is... Um, under the under an epidural it decreases the sensation to void so her her bladder could be filling up so usually we put a fully catheter and hence that's why we do fully catheter um uh checkoffs in fourth semesters because this is when you're going to do them probably and then also uh, the anesthesia can lower the blood pressure so that is one of the things that we do um for um an epidural now, second stage of labor, again, so this is when um, you're completely dilated and you're starting to push. There is um, a thing called laboring down that we do because, like, sometimes these epidurals are so good that there's no, you don't feel that pressure. But again, remember, Ferguson reflex happens at about a plus one station, so that's when mom starts to feel that urge to push or that pressure. So there's a lot of things that we're going to do, like nursing interventions would include like hygiene, especially if they're like having a bowel movement while they push or they're leaking fluid or they have bloody show. Um, so we can just try to keep that little bit area. Plus a warm compress on the vagina helps, you know, decrease, um, uh, decrease the risk for tears. Um, so see how supportive the coach is. So you're assessing that and, you know, and also just communicating and encouraging and teaching pushing techniques because you can't say to you, oh my God, you put, you suck at pushing. You can't do that. Okay. You have to be, um, you know, informative and encouraging. Um, we, but we also have other roles. I mean, you got to be checking, you know, mom's, how's she doing with this? How's she, how's she handling pushing? How's the baby doing? You know, how is the supportive person? You know, um, you know, once she crowns, you know, making sure she stays focused, you know, um, as far as that goes. Maternal position for pushing, actually the best position is squatting because that opens up the pelvis and then there's that gravity. Um, but you probably will not see that. Um, you will probably see them kind of laying in a very low fowlers with somebody holding their legs, them holding their legs back, holding their head up and pushing. Um, and then, then they put into stirrups in the lithotomy position for delivery. So that is kind of like what you're going to probably see. 
You're also going to see two different types of pushing. There's called open glottis pushing and closed glottis pushing. Open glottis pushing is what's recommended, but you probably won't see that either because basically what you're going to see is us doing closed glottis pushing where it's you take a nice deep breath in, you hold it, and then you bear down, and then somebody's going to count to 10. Okay, so that's it's kind of crazy. Um, and then take a breath, do it again. You try to get three good pushes in per contraction. Um, open glottis pushing is where you just like scream it out, but they uh, they say that's the best. However, that's still really not practiced um, wherever I've been. Um, I think that's it on the second stage of labor. Um, we're going to get into the cardinal movements of labor, and you're going to see that. So we've already talked about engagement and descent and flexion. Okay, so what happens is, is, and I'll show you this in class, but then comes internal rotation, then extension, then external rotation, and then expulsion. And you'll see that um, in class on next, next time that we're together. Care of the patient in the second stage of labor. Again, it's, um, you're going to check the fetal heart rate a little bit more frequently. Um, I've already talked about nursing interventions. I tend not to do, depending on, I try to do vital signs a couple times during pushing just because they're pushing every couple minutes and then I don't want their blood pressure to be increased, which it's going to be because they're working hard. Um, episiotomies aren't um, routinely done anymore. Um, laboring down, we just talked about that. Basically, that's where we allow that uh, pressure to mount. There's a lot of positive things about laboring down. One, it decreases um, operative deliveries with forceps or vacuum. Uh, it decreases uh, the, the chance of decelerations and increases the chance of getting an episiotomy. So we've already talked about this already. Um, then the third stage of labor is from the delivery of the placenta, um, from the delivery of the baby to the delivery of the placenta. And what's going to happen is, is as the, when, the, when the baby is born, the uterus is really low. But it, what happens is, is as the placenta starts to detach, the uterus rises, so the uterus kind of takes changes shape and it starts to contract. You might see a sudden gush of blood, you might see a little trickle of blood, um, and then you're going to see the umbilical cord lengthen a little bit as it as the placenta starts to detach. And again, you need to look at that and make sure that it's intact. I'm hoping all of you will have that opportunity to play with the placenta in the hospital because I think it really sends the message home. There's two sides of the placenta we had talked about with fetal development. Um, the maternal side is what we call the dirty Duncan, and it is filled with all different types of vessels and fibrous areas, and that allows it to latch on or to implant into that wall of that uterus. Um, and then the other side is called the shiny Schultz, and that's where the amniotic sac is, that's where the cord is usually, um, and that's where the baby lives. So those are things that we do. At this time, um, you might see them say, start the pit, um, sometimes with the shoulder of the baby or after the delivery of the placenta, and that is to facilitate uterine contractions to control bleeding. We'll talk about how the uterine or the placenta site is now an open wound site on the uterus and how it heals and prepares for the next pregnancy in postpartum. We'll talk about that. Care of the patient in the fourth stage of labor. Um, so this is after the delivery of the placenta. Um, up to about four hours is considered the recovery period. So this is where we're checking them like every 15 minutes. We're checking their um, vital signs. We're running Pitocin and any other medications to facilitate those contractions, especially if mom is not firm, if the, the, the fundus, which is the top of her uterus, is infirm. Um, we're going to check her bladder. We're going to check any type of laceration or um, episiotomy site. We're going to check her vital signs. Um, we're going to look for... Um, the, um, for her feeling in her legs to come back if she had an epidural. Um, ice, Motrin, things are, are just some of the things, or Toradol are some of the things that we, um, what we do. We also encourage, you know, skin to skin, and we also encourage um, breastfeeding. And that is it for this particular monitor. I'm going to do a fetal monitoring uh, lecture separate.